Yeah, I'm here to talk uh, about deep web, although it is not an easy task uh, for many reasons. First of all, because uh, uh, the first rule of the deep web is that you do not, you do not talk about the deep web. And that holds true uh, for the second rule. While uh, uh, the third rule of the deep web is that you can talk uh, of the deep web, but just in terms of lords of drugs, uh, weapons, terrorism, and uh, other similar pleasantries. So, when I talk of the deep, I'm referring to a specific subsection of the net. Uh, usually, deep web can refer to any URL that is not indexed by search engines, so that is invisible to most of the people uh, under the surface, including uh, databases uh, and uh, intranets and so on. But the deep web I'm talking today is that part of the web and those services built upon anonymous networks like Tor. It is about, uh, uh, yeah, it is about the so-called hidden services that allow access to resources without the operator's identity being revealed. Tor, that, uh, as you know, is the most important software and network that lets you surf the web and communicate in, a, in an anonymous way, has offered hidden services since 2004, allowing users not only to surf the web, protecting their identities, but also to run a server under a pseudonym. Their main purpose is to enable freedom of speech, even in situations where the state or other powerful adversaries try to suppress it. Systems to allow anonymous and uh, censorship-resistant uh, distribution of content have been brought to the fore by increasing cases of censorships of blogs, websites, activists. Tor hidden websites include the dissident news, censored or otherwise controversial documents or topics. Of course, providing an anonymous environment can also be attractive for criminal activities. So, uh, what can we find there? As I said, we find uh, services allowing freedom of speech and whistleblowing, such as uh, WikiLeaks, Strongbox, or GlobalLeaks. Well, you know all uh, WikiLeaks. Strongbox is an anonymous service set up by the New Yorker and originally coded by Aaron Swartz to receive tips and leaks. Today, most uh, of the main news organizations are deploying similar systems. Global leaks made by the Hermes Center for Transparency and Digital Human Rights is implemented by many media and NGOs in different countries, you see from uh, anti-corruption activism to investigative journalism, uh, transparency groups, and so on. Then in the deep, uh, we can find the tools to safely communicate and to express dissent. We find activism. Then, of course, in the deep, we can find also black markets, such as the old Silk Road, or Akin forums, cryptocurrencies, forums, and websites services used by botnets, and above all, many websites with political contents or any type of content that can be considered sensitive or questionable by society or by some societies. So, how large is this space? Mining uh, onion addresses, uh, that is, hidden services addresses, called onion addresses, since they end uh, with the word uh, onion, is quite challenging. Many hidden services don't want to be known, so they take measures not to be found. Sites often change address as a cautionary measure. Also, no central entity stores the entire list of onion addresses. And finally, they rarely link to each other. So it's very difficult to map this kind of place. A study made last summer by University of Lex Luxembourg tried nonetheless to analyze Tor hidden services by exploiting a vulnerability in an old Tor version. So they collected 30,000 unique onion addresses. Of course, this should be regarded as a minimum number of hidden services. Then they tried to classify their content. What did they find? 
Well, 17 different languages, among them Arabic, Basque, Chinese, and Bantu. Resources devoted to drug, adult content, weapons, and counterfeit were around 44%. The remaining 56% was mainly about anonymity topics and politics, including uh, reporting and discussing human rights violation, repression, corruption, freedom of speech, leaked cables, and the technical and political aspects of anonymity. And then there were different kind of services, more or less shady. At the end, the researchers wrote that the number of the hidden services devoted to illegal activities and the ones devoted to freedom of expression and legal activities are almost the same. They actually found also a chess server. However, some of the most popular resources are still the ones linked to botnets or adult content and at the time of the paper, Silk Road was among the, most, the top 20 most popular hidden services. This picture confirms an older research called Project Artemis, made by two researchers, who analyzed thousands of deep web addresses. And despite the quote related to cybercrime is remarkable, wrote the researchers, the conclusion is that the Tor network contains also mostly legal content. In particular, the volume of documents related to political issues is in continuous increase. Another project, the AMIA project, that's now part of the Hermes Center, uh, is the most representative and up-to-date Tor hidden service directory and search engine. They found 1,300 working hidden services in this moment and serving just web content. Of course, there are many more hidden services providing other types of internet services. So they collected the, uh, the descriptive information from these services that are online uh, and generated a tag cloud. So this is like the best raw estimate, visual estimate of the type of contents that are published on the hidden services. So as you see, it's about uh, a lot of uh, services and tools about uh, uh, anonymity and uh, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and also uh, markets and, uh, well, cannabis and so on. So uh, as you see, the numbers and uh, classifications are not easy to get. Uh, nonetheless, I think they show a picture that, it, that is less uh, black and white than the one usually portrayed, and more like uh, 50 shades of gray. Also, uh, it is a, a volatile, changing environment. Many hidden services change often address, many become inactive in a short time. So the most stable are usually the ones about e-commerce and hacking. But for the user, it's like surfing an unknown sea without charts or using charts that may be wrong and always changing. At the end, the best way to get information is through the word of mouth. The hidden services have been growing since 2004. So now it's like 10 years of this kind of deep web, which is quite a short time compared to the rest of the internet. But the deep web has become somehow popular in 2011, when Silk Road was born and then the media first report, reported about it, usually in a very picturesque way. The first to break the news on mainstream media was Gawker journalist Adrian Chen. He interviewed one of the buyers, a software programmer, who said he was a libertarian anarchist and believed that anything that's, that's not violent should not be criminalized. The Silk Road administrators talked the same way, quoting agorism, an anarcho-libertarian philosophy. If, if the prosecutor who seized Silk Road are right, its founder was uh, Ross Ulbricht, a 30 years old, a, bri ex a former brilliant American student of physics and solar cells, interested in libertarian ideas, and uh, a former Boy Scout. So philosophy aside, Silk Road 
in 2013 counted on 3,000 listings for items, mainly drugs. In its two and a half years of operation, it saw revenue of more than 9.5 million bitcoins, worth at the time about $1.2 billion. Silk Road made a commission of between 8 to 15 percent, and the system had more than 900,000 9, accounts from uh, countries all over around the globe. A recent uh, academic study claims that Silk Road was uh, a paradigm shifting criminal innovation since it would have been a less violent trade and environment compared to the offline drug markets. And they actually say that it was not just an eBay for drugs, since most of the revenues would come from business to business trade. Uh, Silk Road has been seized by the FBI in, the, in October 2013, uh, but black markets didn't disappear. Uh, actually, they proliferated. Uh, today, there are at least uh, 20 consolidated black markets, according uh, to Deep.web, which is a sort of uh, trip advisor for black markets. Uh, I think to, to understand what's going on in this underworld, we, we, are, we need to understand also the type of people, ideas, and software that are used over there. Who are you going to meet in the Deep? What type of people? Well, a very miscellaneous crowd, actually. You find activists of different countries and different backgrounds, journalists, hackers, cyber criminals with the different specializations, coders and uh, cryptographers, Bitcoin lovers and miners, activists and WikiLeakers, people who represent just one of these things, and people who are sometimes a little bit of almost everything. And finally, also, people committing hateful crimes, not just cyber crimes, like pedophiles. But beware when someone is using this latter fraction of people to attack the whole deep web. In his book, Cypherpunks, Julian Assange warns against the four information Apocalypse Horsemen, terrorism, the war on drugs, pornography, and money laundering. And says that since they can be used to, to scare any public into allowing governments to do anything. Tor is not the only darknet. There are other systems, although less used, like I2P and uh, Freenet. Tor is, is, the most used, is the most used system in this moment and was created by the US government, developed by the Navy, and its initial purpose was to protect communications of the US military. But they had to open it up to anyone since uh, an anonymous system with just one user, well, it's, it doesn't really work. So today Tor is an open source project run by volunteers, supported by activists, nonprofits, universities, and governments. Ironically enough, as we know from, from the Snowden revelations, the same tour has been the main hurdle to the NSA ambitions to surveil and monitor every digital communications. Tor is a precious tool for Chinese dissidents and users too. And it became a precious tool during the Arab Spring. In Iran, Tor usage went from 7,000 users in 2010 to 40,000 users two years later. In Syria, the number of Tor users grew from 600 to 15,000 in just two years. In Turkey, a few months ago, after the government blocked Twitter and YouTube, Tor usage skyrocket. Tor is used even by women's shelters in Boston to protect women who are escaping from abusive partners who tend to use technology to track their victims. Tor use grew in the last year <clears throat> since the revelation of the National Security Agency surveillance programs. Today, there are about uh, two million daily users worldwide but this, in this number, there are also some bots. 
So we cannot know for sure how many the real users are. Uh, according to Runa Sandvik, a security researcher, there are close to a million daily users worldwide. And these are the countries with most users. I think this number is probably going to grow even more. Consider the widespread uh, practice of state censorship and the appalling programs of state surveillance we have seen with the NSA files, and not just with them, the persecution of minorities and activists in many countries, and also the need to express themselves in a safe environment, even within democracies. It is clear that in the need of anonymous publishing is not only here to stay, but it's also something we need to preserve. The need of privacy, of anonymous communication, of a censorship-resistant internet is something deeply connected to, not just to the digital human rights, but to the very human rights. At the end, I think it's something deeply connected to freedom. Thanks.